One of these is a real galaxy. The other is the result of a cosmological computer simulation. You tell the computer some initial conditions about the early universe, you tell it some basic laws of physics that we think are true, and you let it run. Can you tell which one of these images was generated by a computer and which one is a real photo taken by the Hubble Space Telescope? I'll wait. What about these two? Still can't tell? What about these? Comment below. Let me know what you think. And if you get it wrong, I'll call your parents. One of the biggest problems with modern physics is that a lot of times you can know a lot about a system and still not be able to do anything with that knowledge. Take galaxy formation as an example. I can give you equations that govern fluid flow for gases and plasma. I can tell you how gravity works that makes the gas come together. I can give you equations for radiative heating and cooling. If I wanted to, I can even give you equations for stellar feedback events like supernovae, black hole, protostellar jets. I can make this list of equations as long as I want, but is it useful? Not really. If I want to know anything useful, like how our galaxy formed, how our galaxy will evolve, if our theories are even consistent with the observations that we see, if we want to know these things, we have to actually solve these equations. Now do you see the problem? How the hell do you solve that shit? I don't know. You want to give it a shot? It's a pretty big problem in physics. We simply don't have the mathematical tools to do what we want to do. Dude, that's such a lie. If we don't know how to solve the equations, then how'd you show me those simulations? Fantastic question, and I'm really glad you asked so politely. The key word is simulation. When we run a simulation, we're not getting an exact answer to those equations. We use computers to get an approximate answer to those equations. Remember those galaxies that I showed you earlier? They were simulated using fire, a simulation tool that Gungeon from this channel actually worked with during his PhD. And it's not just astrophysics or cosmology. Every single field in physics and engineering deals at least to some degree with solving equations on a computer. It's called numerical analysis. It's an entire field of mathematics and it deals with things like solving partial differential equations, optimization, linear algebra. If you want to be a physicist in today's age, you're going to have to work, at least to some extent, with numerical methods. And that is what this series is going to be all about. So much to cover, let's start small. First thing, let's get rid of those nasty equations and let's start off with a simple ordinary differential equation. Sound good? Yeah, that wasn't really a question. I don't care if you say no. I'm gonna get into the math now. All right, let's start off with a simple example. Let's say that I wanna figure out the motion of a mass tied to the bottom of a spring as it bounces up and down. I can use basic Newtonian mechanics to figure this out. So I know there's a downward force due to gravity. There's an upward force due to the tension of the spring. The downward force is equal to mass times the acceleration of gravity. And if we define the vertical distance that we stretch the spring as y, then by Hooke's law, we know that the upward force is k, the spring constant, times y. Using Newton's second law, f equals ma, we can plug in all the forces, do a little bit of rearranging, and we get an ordinary differential equation that describes the motion of the mass. This is going to be our governing equation. Way simpler than galaxy evolution, I know. But damn, Daniel! You don't actually expect me to explain all of that galaxy evolution stuff in one video, do you? I hope not. Come on, let's, let's start small here. This ODE is actually so simple that if you've ever taken a course in ODEs, you'll recognize that we can solve it exactly. I'm not going to go through the details, but you can use the characteristic polynomial to show that the function that satisfies this ODE is a superposition of sine and cos. So from our governing equation, we get a function that describes the motion of the mass, a pendulum that oscillates up and down in time. The constants C1 and C2 are determined from an initial condition. So let's say that I drop the mass from a position y equals zero. In that case, you can show that C1 is equal to zero and our solution becomes even more simple. All right, for a second, let's pretend that I break my hand. 
and I can't be bothered to write out the solution analytically with my left hand because I'm embarrassed that you're going to judge my terrible handwriting with my left hand. So instead of solving it analytically, why don't we try solving it numerically? How would we do that? Well, there are lots of different ways to solve it. So many different ways. But probably the easiest was developed by Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler in the 1700s. Aside from being just a general mathematical badass, he was also an avid Inter Milan fan. Alright, get ready, I'm going to explain how Euler's method works. But first, this is my exact solution, plotted as a function of time with constants k and m equals to 1. It's an oscillating spring that bounces up and down in time. We are going to use this exact solution to compare our numerical solution to, to see how well it performs. But there's going to be a pretty big difference between our two solutions. Instead of having a continuous function in time, Euler's method is going to discretize time. So we're going to break up time into small time steps h. Our solution is only going to be defined at those points in time, nowhere else. We're giving up knowledge about the underlying continuous function, and now we're talking about a solution that is only defined at distinct points in time. So if I wanted to know the position of my spring at a time in between two time steps, I'm kind of out of luck. But I know what it is at the time step just before, and I know what it is at the time step just afterwards. If I know my initial position, I can approximate my position at the next time step as my current position plus the distance that I travel during that time step. So my position at step 1 is my position at step 0 plus the change in time between the time steps times the velocity that I'm traveling at. Now the change in time is my time step and the velocity is the derivative of my position. And I can do this for all future time steps where I get y2 from y1 and y3 from y2 and so on which allows me to write it in a general form where I get the n plus 1th time step position from the nth time step position and velocity. Now the viewer endowed with a particularly large brain will notice that this is a first order Taylor expansion. I am approximating my function as a linear function in t. Assuming that I keep my time step relatively small, I don't have to think about the ODE at all. If I know the value of y at any time, and I know the derivative of y, then I instantly have an approximation for the value of y at the next time step. I never have to analytically solve the ODE or get an explicit expression for y. It's remarkably powerful and simple, because I can apply this to just about any ODE and get an approximate answer. But dude, we don't know the derivative of our position. Shut up. Okay, it's true. In our case, we don't actually know the first derivative. But it's not a problem because we can just apply Euler's method twice. We do know the second derivative. So we can apply Euler's method once to get the first derivative from the second derivative, and then apply it again to get the position from the first derivative. These three equations, therefore, are all I need to approximately solve for the position of the spring at any time. If I have an initial position and an initial velocity, I just plug them into my ODE and immediately get an expression for the position and velocity at the next time step. The best part is, you can code this up in 5 minutes. I wrote a quick little Python script to test it out. You can play around with it yourself if you want. I put the link to the Git repository in the video description. Ready to see how this code performs? Once again, I'll set k and m equals to 1 and I'll take a relatively small time step of h equals 0.1 seconds. And if I let it run, I get a spring that is bouncing up and down in time. That's pretty awesome. Whoa, wait a second. Did you notice something weird there? Did you see how the oscillations seem to get bigger and bigger near the end? That doesn't really make sense. But it could just be that our time step is too large. The error introduced by that first order Taylor approximation is just too coarse. So let's try it again with a smaller time step of 10 times smaller, 0.01 seconds. Much better. By making the time step smaller, we now have an approximate numerical solution that is much closer to our exact analytical solution. And if you were to actually look at how the error scales with time step, so how fast the difference between the approximate and exact solution gets smaller as we take a smaller and smaller time step, 
you would find that it scales linearly, consistent with the fact that we're doing a first order Taylor expansion. So in the limit, as you take an infinitely small time step, your error goes to zero, which means that your approximate solution recovers the exact solution. That's amazing when you think about it. We barely did any work at all, and we now have an approximate solution that we can make as close as we want to the exact solution, and all we have to take is a time step small enough. For all you lazy people out there, you know who you are. How awesome is that? That is the power of numerical analysis. POWER! You can't take an infinitely small time step. Shut up, I know, I know. You can't actually take an infinitely small time step. Even using the most powerful supercomputers, eventually you'll reach a point where the time step is so small that it's gonna take the computer forever to cycle through all the time steps. That's why you want numerical methods that are as efficient as possible. There are some methods out there like Runge-Kutta methods that are way more accurate and have an error that scales not linearly, but to the third or the fourth power. So you can take a way larger time step and get just as accurate an answer. But efficiency isn't the only thing that we care about. I'll show you an even more subtle problem. Let's look at the solution we got from the explicit Euler method using a really small time step of 0.01 seconds. Do you see how the oscillations near the end still seem to get a little bit bigger? Now, that's a problem because if you let this keep running, you'll see that the oscillations are growing. They'll get larger and larger and larger. They're gonna grow unboundedly. And that's a pretty big problem because if you're interested in the position of the spring at really long times, your solution is gonna become pretty garbage pretty quickly. Why is our error growing unboundedly? Well, to answer this question, I'm gonna to have to throw a little bit more heavy math at you. Okay, let's go back to those three equations that we said define explicit Euler method for our problem. But you can take the ODE and actually plug it in directly into the explicit Euler method. So we actually just have two equations. These two equations are what we're actually solving when we do explicit Euler's method. It turns out that this system of two equations can actually be solved analytically using pretty much the same techniques as we use for ordinary differential equations. But they're not called ordinary differential equations. These are ordinary different equations. And because we're doing an example that's pretty simple, it turns out that these ordinary difference equations are actually pretty easy to solve. I'm not gonna go through the details, but you can convince yourself that these are the solutions to these two difference equations. If you plug these in to the above equations, you'll find that it satisfies them. If you don't feel like plugging these in yourself, you can just believe me. You can trust me because I would never lie to you because I love you. So here's our numerical solution. As before, C1 and C2 are constants that are determined from our initial condition. So using the same initial condition where I drop the mass from rest at y equals zero. And I'm also gonna get rid of the velocity equation. I'm only gonna keep the position equation that I care about. So this is the approximate solution that the explicit Euler method is giving us. So let's recap what we've done so far. We start off with our governing ODE that tells us about our system. But if we want useful answers out of this, we have to solve the ODE. Since it's a simple example, in this case, we can solve it analytically, and this is the exact solution. But in a more general case, we would want to use a numerical method. So we can apply Euler's method, which is described by these two equations, and using that method, then this is the discrete solution that we get. But again, we don't always know explicit expressions for the discrete solution and the analytical solution. We only know that in this case because it's a simple example. So we have the exact analytical solution and the approximate numerical solution. If you're wondering why they look so different, you might be surprised to learn that they're actually not. All you need to do to see this is rewrite our exact solution as a discrete function in time so replace t with our time step times the number of time steps, and then Taylor expand the terms on the inside. You'll see that to a low order approximation, the two expressions are actually pretty similar. Applying the Euler's method gives you a solution that approximates the exact solution. Cool, eh? So why does this approximate solution blow up in time? 
why does the error grow unboundedly? Well, it's pretty obvious if you look at this expression. Look at the two modes in the solution. They're complex numbers, so they're going to oscillate in time, which makes sense, it's a bouncing spring. But crucially, their magnitudes are greater than 1. So as I march through time and n gets larger and larger, I'm raising these modes to higher and higher powers. And since their magnitude is greater than 1, that means that their magnitude is increasing. The solution will grow exponentially. So we have just proven that although Euler's method gives us a solution that approximates the exact solution, it is unstable. No matter how small you choose your time step, eventually you're going to run into problems because your solution blows up. This is a huge thing in numerical analysis. Not only do you want methods that give you the correct answer as you take smaller time steps, but you also want a method that is stable. For this simple spring problem, there's actually a really easy fix that we can do to make Euler's method stable. Let's go back to how we defined Euler's method. All I'm going to do is make a tiny change. Are you ready? Wow, that magic trick gets me every time. Did you notice the change? All I did was replace the velocity to use the updated value instead of the previous value. It seems like a tiny change, but it has a huge effect on the stability of the solution. If you go through all the same steps as before, you get your ordinary difference equation and you solve it, you'll find that your approximate solution looks very similar to the one that we were working with earlier, but this time those complex modes have a magnitude equal to 1. So they're going to oscillate in time, giving us a bouncing spring, but as you raise them to higher powers of n, they won't blow up. You won't have any exponential growth of error, any exponential decay of error. Your solution will just oscillate exactly as you want from a bouncing spring. Now I'm not going to show you exactly what sigma 1 and sigma 2 are because their expressions are a little bit uglier in this case, it's pretty long. But the crucial part is that their magnitudes are equal to 1. You can prove that they're stable. A simple change to your numerical method can have a dramatic impact on the resulting accuracy and reliability of your solution. So remember, there are many numerical methods out there, and you have to be sure that the method that you're choosing is appropriate for the problem you're solving. All in all, again, our spring example was simple, and that's why we were able to analyze exactly what went wrong. In general though, for example if we're running galaxy evolution simulations, we don't have the luxury of using the simple analysis that we did here. That's why, as problems get more and more complex, you need more and more sophisticated methods to ensure that the answers you're getting are accurate, efficient, and stable. I'll go over more advanced algorithms in the future. For example, I'll talk about the algorithms that I do my own personal research on, entropy stable methods. I think in the next video I'm going to jump into solving PDEs already too. It seems like it would be way harder, but it's actually not. You just treat the spatial derivatives separately from the temporal derivatives and then you can apply similar algorithms like we did here. I'll explain all of that stuff later. I think I've done enough for today. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments, or ask me on our Discord, have a conversation with me. Until then, I'll see you next time. Good night, guys. Sweet dreams. Okay, bye-bye.